In section six of chapter seven, it's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, and we're going to cover quite a few objectives. Uh, you're going to notice here that we're going to address five of them. Um, numbers 19 through 23. Uh, 19 is we're going to understand visually when a quadratic has one, two, or no zeros. Uh, again, review from Algebra 2x. Number 20, find and understand multiplicities of the zeros of a polynomial. This may be a newer concept for you, but not a difficult one. Uh, 21, understand the, or determine the degree of a polynomial function from a graph. Uh, 22, understand and verify that complex zeros occur in pairs. And 23, fully factor po polynomials with complex zeros using long division. We're ultimately working our way to objective 23. Um, so let's get into the first slide, which covers the first objective of understanding the graphs visually. This here is objective 19. It says understand visually when a quadratic has one, two, or no zeros. Um, when you take a look at it, uh, one thing we know is the quadratic formula, by the way. Quadratic formula, recall, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. If you remember in that, this b squared minus 4ac is called the discriminant. And the discriminant is a short way to be able to figure out how many times a, a parabola will cross the x-axis, if at all. Um, if we look here at the first graph, um, if we notice this thing is going to cross the x-axis twice, which tells us the value underneath the square root symbol when we compute it with a quadratic formula will be positive. So it's going to be a positive value. If that value under the quadratic formula is zero, or the discriminant is zero, um, then what's going to happen, it's only going to cross one time at its vertex. If b squared minus 4ac is a negative number, we're going to have imaginary solutions, and imaginary solutions means that visually the parabola will never cross the x-axis. Um, you can't see imaginary answers. Now, if we take a look at these three parabolas, um, this one up here is actually factorable. It factors quite nicely into x minus 2 and x minus 4. If you take those factors and set them equal to 0, you're going to see that the zeros happen at 2 and at 4, which we can visually see in the graph. This next graph right here, um, here is the uh, parabola for it and the equation. This is also factorable. It factors nicely into x minus 3 times x minus 3. There's really only one factor, but the, the factor happens two times, and we do call that something special. We'll get into more detail. It's called multiplicity. Um, but if you set that factor equal to 0, the 0 is going to happen at the number 3, which is what we can see in the graph. Now, this third one doesn't cross the x-axis. So it doesn't have real zeros, but it does have imaginary zeros. This problem is factorable, but we're going to need some help to factor it. Um, and that's what we're going to address more today. Uh, the factors for this is going to be x, and it's going to be minus 3 minus i is one factor. The other factor is x um, minus 3 plus i. Now, the zeros of that, they do exist. The zeros happen at 3 minus i and 3 plus i. And we will dive more into this last one, uh, where that's uh, number 23 in terms of the objective fully factor polynomials with complex zeros, we will use long division to do so. So this does cover objective one. Now this next slide is going to uh, cover objective number 20, or the second objective today. Find and understand multiplicities of zeros of a polynomial. And multiplicity is this. It is uh, the zero or r of the polynomial that is the highest power. So back on the first slide, when we factored that problem, we had x minus 3 times x minus 3. Um, we mathematically would combine that and call it x minus 3 all squared, uh, which means the highest power of that particular factor is 2. So we would say that in this case, it has a, uh, x minus 3 has a multiplicity of 2. Okay. Let's look at this activity, and I'll show you. Um, they want us to graph this particular function here and do it when n is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then make a quick sketch of it. So if we take a look at that, 
um, the first equation, if we were just to write it, if n is 1, you're going to have y equals x plus y and then x minus 2. And we could get a sketch of that one. Um, if we're going to do n is 2, we'll just write that up here for space, x plus 1 and then x minus y or x minus 2 squared. Okay, um, for the 3, x plus 1, x minus 2 cubed, and so forth. So what you're seeing just for these first three, if I asked you to find the zeros, you would take these factors and set them equal to zero. And then I would do the same thing for this problem and for this problem. You could set them equal to zero. Um, and what's going to end up happening is you're going to have the same zeros happening. So each of these graphs will have their zeros happening at a negative 1 and a positive 2. Okay. But the graphs are going to look slightly different because they're larger polynomial functions. Um, this first function, by the way, has a degree of 2 if you multiply it out. Uh, this one is going to have a degree of 3 if you multiply it out longhand. You're going to get x cubed. If you multiply this thing out longhand, you're going to get x to the fourth power. So it's going to be the degree of 4. Now I'm going to pause the video real quick and draw the sketches, and then you can see the sketches pop in front of you. So just hold tight for one second here. These are the quick thumbnail sketches of these. Um, you could put them in your graphing calculators and see more of the detail. Um, what you should notice is that when you do change the power, when it goes up by 1, 2, or 3, it does change the shape of the graph because uh, they are different functions. Um, one thing you should notice here is take a look at the odd exponent here when n is 1 versus 3 versus 5. Um, again, the degree of the function for when n is 3, if I multiply this out, it's going to be x to the fourth power. That's an even function um, in terms of you have the uh, exponent is an even power, is the highest one. Notice how they both go up. The graph goes up on the right side and left side. Uh, when n is 5 is the same thing. They both go up on the right and left side, same when n is 1. Now when n is a 2 or a 4, you're going to notice, in this case, the degree of the function when n is 2, it's actually going to be a cubic function, and they go in the opposite direction. So when n is 2 and n is 4, in this case, they travel in opposite directions because they do end up becoming, um, having themselves um, an odd exponent for that. Now, on this slide, we're still talking about multiplicities, but let's look at this first theorem. The fundamental theorem of algebra tells you this, is that if you have a polynomial that has a degree of n being 1 or higher, so linear or quadratic or quartic, with complex coefficients, then there's at least one complex, 0. Here's what it tells you, what it means in simple terms. If you have a polynomial function, no matter how high the degree is, you will have at least one 0. You're guaranteed to have one 0. Now, that zero might be a complex number. It might be imaginary and you can't see it on the graph. It might be a zero that happens many times, so it's being duplicated or triplicated. But you will have at least one. Okay. Now, this theorem, zeros of a polynomial, the second one says this. Again, a polynomial with a degree of one or higher, with complex coefficients, has exactly n complex zeros if multiplicities are counted. What that means is this, is that you could have, if you have like y equals x to the seventh power, means that function has exactly seven zeros. There are exactly seven zeros. If you had y equals x to the fifth, there's exactly five zeros. Now, when you graph this function, you may only see it cross the x-axis one time, which might be confusing because you would think you would see all five zeros. What it means is these graphs, you may have to look at their multiplicities, which means when you factor the, the problem, if you factor it, you might see the same factor happen seven times. And in this case, when you factor this one, what you're going to get is you would have to uh, write this out as seven x's. And you would set each factor equal to zero, which means the zero factor happens seven times. So let's just look at this uh, number example and see if that makes sense for you. Okay. On this problem, they want us to find the zeros of this polynomial function. 
It's a third degree polynomial and indicate their multiplicities, if any. Now, a third degree multi multiple here has to have exactly three zeros. So there are three zeros for this function. Okay. Um, let's see if we can factor it and see if there's three unique zeros or are some of them being duplicated. So to factor this, what you can do is there is a GCF. You can pull out an X. So you're left with X squared minus 24X plus 144. This trinomial can be factored further into X minus 12 and another X minus 12. Now, to find the zeros of this function, set it equal to zero, and then set each factor equal to zero. When you solve it, you're going to get x is zero as one factor, x is 12, I'm sorry, is another zero, and x is 12 is another zero. So you would say, yes, this does have three zeros. They're not all unique. So how you would say it is this. The zeros are zero and 12 with multiplicity of 2. When you say that, it tells someone that the 0 of 12 happens twice. So if they were to write the equation from it, they would have to realize that there's actually two factors uh, for each of the, the two 12s that showed up. You know, take a look at this trinomial here, and I'm going to encourage you to try it, pause the video, and then pop the video back up. Try to factor this to the best of your ability. And it looks overwhelming, but think of a GCF. What can you pull out of this whole thing? And then try some basic factoring. From there, take the factors, find the zeros, and state all the zeros for me and their multiplicities. So go ahead, pause the video, and see if you have the right answer. Hopefully you came up with this. Um, this is factorable, pull out the GCF, and then take each factor, set it equal to zero. You're going to notice that one-third happens twice, so you'd say one factor or one zero is one-third with multiplicity of two. But be careful, this function technically has 15 zeros because it is a 15-degree polynomial. You must state all 15 of them. Well, zero had to happen 13 times. You will never see in the graph this thing crossing zero 13 times, but it technically does. And this is how you can tell is by looking at the actual degree of the function. You will truly see this graph cross the x-intercept twice, once at zero and once at one-third, which might kind of mimic a parabola, but this is not a parabola. That's a second-degree function. This is a 15th-degree function. Okay, the third objective today was to determine the degree of a polynomial function from a graph. And here's what you can do. Uh, there's this theorem. It's called uh, the Wiglinus theorem, and it says this. Let P of X be a polynomial of degree 1 or higher. The graph of P can cross any horizontal line at most n times. So if you look at this function here, um, currently it crosses the x-axis only three times. Now, if it crosses three times, you might think it's a third-degree polynomial. Again, think back to a parabola. A parabola in a basic format crosses two times, and it's an x-squared function. So if it crosses 3, you might think it's an x-cubed function. But what you have to do is this. You need to find the horizontal line that crosses the most points. If you draw the dotted line they have here, this thing is going to cross 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times, which tells you this function here has to be a fifth-degree polynomial so it's a fifth degree polynomial. But what we know about the polynomial is that three of the real zeros we see, it has three real zeros because we can see it. Of that fifth degree, three are real zeros. So it means that the other two um, have to be either a multiplicity of those three real zeros or they're complex. So the other two are either complex numbers, which are imaginary, part imaginary, or there's some multiplicity going on of those real zeros that are above there. And the other thing to be cautious of is here is, remember, we can see the real zeros. Again, there's three real. The horizontal line test tells us there's up to five real. Um, 
so the three we see, some of these three might be repeated. Maybe this one here happens three times. If that happens three times, this happens once, that happens once, then there's five real zeros. Some of them just have multiplicity. Now, it could be, though, like I said, the other two that we don't see might be imaginary. Or there could be even more imaginaries that you don't see. Um, because you can't see imaginary answers in a graph. So this is for sure is a fifth degree function, if not higher, assuming if there were imaginary zeros. Okay, let's take a look at some more. Okay, here's a different spin on the same objective of determining the degree or how many zeros a polynomial has. This function right here, because I see the equation, I didn't see the equation on that last graph, I just saw the graph. Here I see the equation, so I know for a fact this has to be a fifth degree polynomial. It is. It is no bigger or nor, nor any smaller than that. It's a fifth degree polynomial. Now, is it made up of real answers or imaginary? I don't know. When I graph it, I would see. If it never crosses the x-axis, then they're all imaginary answers, which can't be the case for this function, though. Um, if you graph it and it crosses the x-axis once, maybe that one x-intercept or that zero happens five times to make up for the fifth degree. Or maybe it happens in, in different uh, real and imaginary. So it's fifth degree, possible combination of real and complex numbers. Remember, complex is just uh, bringing in real and imaginary together. But we would want to look at the graph to see what would happen. Here's another practice one of one we did two slides ago, and I encourage you to pause this and see what you get for an answer. What's the lowest possible degree of this polynomial function graphed here? Okay, pause the video, think about it, and then I'll have the answer pop up on the screen for you. All right, this is what you should have gleaned from this picture. There are two real zeros because we see them cross the x-axis. But if you do the horizontal line test, it crosses this graph four times, which means there could be up to four real zeros. So what that tells us written in the brown is this. There are two unique real zeros, but there could be multiplicity of those real zeros to get us the four, or there could be complex zeros, imaginary answers that we can't see in the graph that would make up the other two or possibly even more. And folks, the key here, too, is when they say, what's the lowest possible degree? Because we can't see the imaginary answers on a graph, there could be imaginary answers in this problem. I don't know. Someone would need to tell me what is the actual degree of this function. If they told me it was a fourth degree function, then if it was x to the fourth of something, then again, then I would know there's only four, real, only four zeros. It could be two more reals that make up the multiplicity, or they could be two imaginaries. This next slide says complex conjugates theorem, which is going to tell us this. The fourth objective, understand and verify that complex zeros occur in pairs. What that means is this. If one of the zeros is an imaginary number, which is a plus bi, for example, right here, then we are guaranteed its complex conjugate must be a zero, a minus bi. So in this case, they have to happen in pairs. Now let's do example three in two parts. Uh, part A says verify that 2i is a zero of the function. This is a third degree polynomial. So let's put 2i into it. And if it's a zero, the answer should come back to be zero. So let's do 2i cubed minus 2, 2i squared plus 12, 2i minus 8. Um, this is going to be 2i cubed is going to be 8i cubed. Uh, and this is going to be 2 times 2i squared is going to be 4i squared, 24i minus 8. Um, what you can do, uh, 3 times 8 obviously is 24. I'm going to rewrite this as an i squared times i. That's i cubed. Um, this here is going to be 2 times 4 is 8. But i squared is a negative 1. Then plus 24i minus 8. What's going to happen here, uh, negative 8 times negative 1 is positive 8. That and that's going to cancel. Here an i squared becomes a negative 1. So negative 1 times 24 is negative 24i plus 24i, which comes out to 0. That mathematically proves that 2i is a 0 of that function. 
Now, what they want us to do is find the remaining zeros of p of x and their multiplicity. Here's the nice thing. Because 2i is a 0, I'm guaranteed that negative 2i must also be a 0. They have to travel in pairs. Okay. So how can I factor this problem? Um, what I'm going to do is I know if those are the zeros, then I know that their factors are x minus 2i and x plus 2i. Those two zeros make those two factors. I'm going to multiply this, these two binomials through and get a divisor, and then I'm going to do long division to figure out what the other factor. So if I multiply this through, it's going to be x squared uh, plus 2ix minus 2ix uh, minus 4i squared. It's going to simplify to x squared plus 4. Again, those two factors become x squared minus 4. So I'm going to go to the next slide, and I'm going to take x squared minus 4 and divide it out of this third-degree polynomial. Whatever I'm left with is going to give me the other factor. So let's set that up. Long division. Uh, again, we have 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 12x minus 8. And we decided we or know we need to divide out x squared plus 4. If we do the long division on here, this has to be, um, looks like I'm missing a cubed here, sorry, that should be cubed. Uh, to make an x squared of 3x cubed, I need a 3 and an x. Multiply that through. 3x cubed will be plus 12x. Come in and subtract this whole thing, so if I subtract this whole thing, this becomes mi minus and this becomes minus. Um, the x cubes drop out. I bring down a negative 2x squared. My 12x minus 12x is 0, and I bring down negative 8. Now I want to make an x squared a negative 2x squared, so I need a negative 2. Multiply that through. Negative 2x squared minus 8. Come through and subtract. I'm going to change the signs, and I get a remainder of 0. So what I've done is they've asked me to find the remaining zeros in their multiplicity. This is a factor. So in terms of factoring this, you guys, I factored it into x minus 2i, x plus 2i, and now 3x minus 2. They want the remaining zeros. So to find the zeros of that, we know one of the zeros was 2i, one was negative 2i, I can find this particular remaining 0 by just taking it and setting it equal to 0, so it's 2 thirds. So the final answer, what are the zeros of the function for part b? The zeros are 2i, negative 2i, and 2 thirds. And that's how you do that objective. Now this slide here is the last objective, is to fully factor polynomials with complex zeros using long division. We have a cubic function here, and they want us to basically find all the zeros. Um, what you might want to do is see if you can factor this by grouping. If you're comfortable with factor by grouping, try it and see if you can do it. Um, I don't know if this one works that well. Actually, I, I believe it doesn't work at all for factoring. It's not actually factorable. Uh, so what you want to do here is if we know negative 1 is a 0, we know that x plus 1 is a factor. So let's divide that factor out of here. So take the polynomial and divide out x plus 1. Now I'm going to stop the video or pause it and actually do all the work for the long division. Um, I encourage you to do that and when you pop the screen back up you will see the long division and then we'll talk about how do we end up finding all the zeros. All right, so when you do the long division, you're going to be back out, and you're going to end up getting this particular um, trinomial here, 4x squared plus 2x plus 3. And we have this right here, too. These two, if I multiply them together, by the way, will give me the original function. Now, they do want you to find all the zeros. So we clearly know negative 1 is a 0, but can I factor 4x squared plus 2x plus 3? If you try to factor it, it unfortunately is unfactorable. The only way you can finish doing this problem is you have to be able to finish factoring this, and you can't do it over the integers. So what you have to do is find the zeros of this function by doing the quadratic formula. 
So let's go on to the next slide and I'll do the quadratic formula for this. All right, so here's the, the trinomial again. Again, we know this is one factor, therefore one of the zeros is negative one. So we're, we're almost there, we need the other two. Let's do the quadratic formula. So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. If you simplify this, um, I'm going to pause this and see what we get. And then here's what we get is this right here. Um, and what we should do, because what we end up getting is an imaginary number under the square root, we should write this complex number as real and imaginary, so it would be negative one-fourth plus or minus i times the square root of 11 over 4. That is two, those are two of the roots. They happen to be imaginary roots. Uh, the other root that we had, again, they told us was negative 1. So when they said find the zeros or the roots, we found there's one real and there's two imaginaries. This is why the imaginaries um, or the complex numbers happen in pairs is because of the plus or minus component of the quadratic formula. In terms of the homework, what you can go ahead and do is skip numbers 18 and 20. There's going to be enough practice amongst all the other problems there.